afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all here uh, at the at the World Affairs Council of Northern California at an event that's co organized with the Marines Memorial Association. I am Anya Manuel. I'm a partner at Rice Hadley Gates, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. Uh, before we begin, I've been asked to do a couple of housekeeping issues, very short. First, I wanted to say that the Marines Memorial Association is a nonprofit veterans organization that honors the valor and memory of members of the United States Armed Forces. And you're here in this beautiful um, building as a result of this. The World Affairs Council of Northern California offers a forum where a wide variety of audiences from the Bay Area and elsewhere engage with members of the foreign policy community and others. And I've um, had the privilege of working with them for the past two years since I've been out here from Washington, and they're really a wonderful organization. Uh, this program will be recorded for radio, and I wanted to specifically thank our audio engineer, Jane Heaven, who makes all this work. Uh, please take a quick moment to turn off all your cell phones and pagers so we're not interrupted. In the second part of the program, we will take questions from the audience. So you each have blue question cards. Please write down your questions, and they'll be passed up, and then I will have a chance to ask them to General Odierno on your behalf. Uh, lastly, uh, General Odierno has to leave immediately after this program. So if you wouldn't mind, at the end of the program, just staying seated for a minute, allowing him to leave, and then we can all get up and make our exit. Now it's my honor to introduce our distinguished guest. General Ray Odierno assumed duty as the 38th Chief of Staff for the U.S. Army in September of 2011. He attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and during his more than 36 years of service, he has commanded units at every echelon, from platoon to theater, and has done duty in Germany, Albania, Kuwait, Iraq, and the United States. I, I know you all have a copy of his bio there, so I'm just giving you a couple of highlights here. Um, his recent achievements uh, from October 2010 to August 2011, General Odierno commanded the United States Joint Forces Command. And prior to that, he served as the commanding general of U.S. forces in Iraq, where he deserves great credit for having implemented a lot of the surge strategy that started in 2007. While serving as the assistant to the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff from 2004 to 2006, General Odierno was the primary military advisor to secretaries of state Colin Powell and then Condoleezza Rice. He's here to discuss uh, the United States Army, the strength of the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome General Odierno. Well, thank you, Anya. I really appreciate that wonderful introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, tremendous to be here. I have about 20 minutes worth of remarks, and then I look forward uh, to your questions. Uh, it's great for me to be back in North, Northern California. Time flies, though. About 20 years ago, I was a battalion commander down at Fort Ord, down in Monterey. And uh, I can't believe it was 20 years ago, frankly, as I stand here today. But what a great part of the country. And my wife and I was with me here today. are so happy to be back here, to be back in Northern California. I'd like to recognize just a few people before I get started. First, uh, Jane Wales, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council. Jane, thanks for your invitation to address this great organization. It really is uh, fun to be here. You're a great leader, and it's an honor to be here with you. General Retired Mike Mayette, U.S. Marine Corps President, CEO of the Marines Memorial Foundation. Sir, where are you? Are you here? I don't know if you're here or not. Well, thanks thanks for your leadership. Command Sergeant Major Retired Joe Sweeney, who's the civilian liaison to the Secretary of the Army for Northern California, sir, thank you. Brigadier General Retired Tom Swindler, President of AUSA, San Francisco Chapter. Really happy that you could be here. And then Anya, thank you so much also for your service with the State Department and your continuing service 
as you work at Stanford University as a fellow. I really do appreciate it in your diverse career. Well, it's great to be here at the Marine Memorial Association building. It really is quite a facility uh, right in the heart of, of San Francisco. And it is important that I'm here because specifically throughout our country's history, but over the last 11 years, the Army and Marine Corps have worked together side by side, shoulder to shoulder, in some of the most complex environments uh, that you'd ever see. And as we look to the future, all the armed forces and services will continue to build upon what we have learned and what does it mean for us as a military as we move forward. So this afternoon, I'd like to comment on the challenges of the global environment and the Army's role in the environment as I see it as we move towards the future. As I look around here, I see these medals on the wall and you see the Purple Heart right in front of me and, and several other commendations to include the Medal of Honor over there to the left and several other distinguished awards. And this comes to mind that uh, since 2001, our U.S. soldiers have earned over 15,000 Medals of Valor, six Medals of Honor, 25 Distinguished Service Crosses, and 654 Silver Stars. These are the type of young men and women that we have. And the service of these young men and women has been steadfast and unwavering through these very difficult times. And while some people really look at medals and not sure what to make of them, I'm telling you that every one of these medals I just mentioned, all of those soldiers would tell you they were just doing their job. They didn't do anything extra special. They were just there for their comrades side by side and you know, happened to be there when the situation got difficult. As I stand here today, we have 89,000 soldiers deployed around the world. We have 65,000 in Afghanistan. We have another 15,000 in other parts of the Middle East, as well as continuing to have a presence on the Korean Peninsula. Our army continues to be recognized not only by our allies, but our antagonists and adversaries as the best army in the world. And that's the challenge that we have as we move forward. We must remain the best army in the world. We must incorporate what we have learned, what lessons we've learned. How does that project into the complex future environment that we will face while counting for the fiscal realities that our country face? General Omar Bradley said it best in 1951 when he was the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. American armed strength is only as strong as the combat capabilities of its weakest service. Overemphasis on one or the other will obscure our compelling need, not for air power, not for sea power, but for American military power commensurate with our tasks in the world. As we think about our tasks in this world, we have to assess the current situation. The Army must and will adapt to meet the involving strategic environment that we see. But today, more than ever before, this environment around us continues to evolve in many unpredictable ways. The widespread availability of advanced technologies, the proliferation of information fueled by a globally connected society, and the emergence of numerous challenges to political and societal order are just a few of the many factors shaping the international environment that we now operate in. Today and into the foreseeable future, the global environment will be characterized by both complexity and uncertainty. Many of you are aware of the Arab Spring that is currently going on in the Middle East. I would argue that this is just in, in the very infant stages. We don't know what the impact will ultimately be on our own security and our own national defense as we watch things play out in the Middle East. We are watching Syria carefully, playing right now in front of our eyes. What impact does that have on Israel, on Iraq, on Lebanon, on Turkey, on Jordan, on Iran? How will Egypt and Libya turn out? 
now that they have new governmental orders. What does that mean to stability in the Middle East? Iran continues to be a destabilizing influence in the region with their pursuit of nuclear weapons. South Asia remains a complex environment with various extremist groups impacting security in Pakistan and India. And in the Asia Pacific, China's search for hydrocarbons has impacted the relation with both the Philippines and Vietnam, while North Korea is now led by a 29-year-old. And its lack of transparency continues to cause us concern and continues to add to the uncertainty that we face in this region. So I tried to describe very quickly that the range of threats we face are wide and diverse. It includes traditional nation states, near states, and proxies, as well as transnational terror networks, criminal organizations, and popular movements. We must be prepared to deal with multiple actors, asymmetric and technologically enabled techniques, and exploitation of information. Here in San Francisco, so close to the centers of technology growth, you know how small technological developments can so quickly affect the entire world. Advances in social media and smartphones have quickly reduced barriers to information access. Today, these devices allow more actors to influence international audiences. In fact, this afternoon, I'll visit Google to learn about what they are doing and see how they might affect the future strategic environment. We must understand the continued competition for wealth, resources, political authority, influence, sovereignty, identity or legitimacy. Unexpected opportunists and suppressed threats will emerge from this competition. And our responsibility in national defense is still to protect this country, sustain our freedoms and liberties, and keep our children safe for the future. That's the challenge we face. It is difficult to see the current strategic environment inherently trending toward peace unless we act to positively influence it. It depends on how we understand and engage in competition and cooperation with the globalized world. One thing I know for sure is we must remain engaged. Understanding this current strategic environment is imperative to contextualize what I think the Army needs to look like in the year 2020. Moving forward, our Army's primary purpose is resolute, to fight and win our nation's wars. But the Army must be able to do much more than that. So thinking through this, I've developed five priorities. One is, priority number one is that the Army will remain committed to our currently 89,000 deployed soldiers. They will continue to be the best trained, best equipped, and best led land force in the world. My second priority is the continued development of the Army for the future as part of Joint Force 2020. Developing this future force will require a versatile mix of capabilities, formations, and equipment that will enable us to succeed in a full range of missions understanding the fiscal realities. Looking ahead, I believe there are several key characteristics that are essential to any future force. We must have depth and versatility. We must be adaptive to the ever-changing state of warfare and innovative to adjust to these adaptations. We must be flexible and agile in our responsiveness, integrated and synchronized within the larger effort of the joint force. And finally, it's imperative that we remain lethal and discriminate. And it's what I call discriminately lethal. It's becoming more and more important as we move forward that as we use lethality, it must be something that is used precisely and make sure it has the right impact. And I believe there's no more discernible or discriminate weapon than an American soldier or a Marine on the ground, being able to determine good and bad, 
being able to limit collateral damage, being able to limit the killing of innocent civilians. This is becoming more and more important, and it's important that we recognize this. My third priority is to sustain our high-quality all-volunteer force. We are blessed with incredible volunteers, and it's my aim to keep it that way. Fourth, we must adapt our ability to develop our leaders for the future. We ask much more of our junior leaders today than was certainly expected of me when I was a lieutenant. So it's imperative that we develop them to be able to think through these complex problems and operate in these difficult environments and uncertain situations that they are most certainly sure to experience. And finally, we must reinvigorate our commitment to the profession of arms throughout the Army. We are given unique responsibilities to fulfill important obligations to our nation. And rightfully so, the military is held to a higher standard than other professions. The Army is built on the bedrock of trust, the trust between soldiers, the trust between soldiers and the leaders, Values, standards, and discipline have long been our watchwords, and they are more essential today than ever. The past decade of conflict informs our thinking as we look ahead. Because we've adapted to the wars we've been fighting, the Army has been focused on a specific set of needs. However, those needs and the means in which they are resourced have changed, so we must fundamentally change how we do business. As the United States confronts a record deficit and a record debt, we must ensure disciplined stewardship of resources in order to get the most out of the investment of our public dollars. It is imperative that we sustain a balanced investment between three key variables in the Army, and I call them the end strength, our readiness, and our modernization programs. Over the next several years, we'll be required to continually assess, refine, and manage our resources. For instance, if we kept too much force structure or end strength, but lacked the resource to keep it properly trained and modernized, the result would be what we call a hollow force. The Army end strength is going down. And over the next five years, we'll reduce 80,000 soldiers out of our Army. We will do this with a sustained and deliberate ramp that will allow us to take care of our soldiers, provide required forces for Afghanistan and other contingencies, and regenerate forces if needed. The Army of 2017, although similar in size, will be much different than the one of 2001. It is, it is of course, a more combat seasoned, experienced, and capable force. In terms of modernization, we're making select investments even as our overall end strength decreases and the dollars that are available decreases. We are developing a versatile and affordable mix of equipment to ensure the American soldier remains the most discriminately lethal force on the battlefield. These include some priorities, such as individual soldier systems, weapons, protective gear, the ability to gather information from the individual soldier up to the most senior individual through our networks. We're developing a new ground combat vehicle, a new tactical wheeled vehicle, and we continue to modernize our rotary wing aviation fleet. The Army's modernization program is focused on providing our soldiers and small units maximum tactical capability while improving mobility, protection, and access to information. Improvements of the Army network will give our soldiers and squads precise, analyzed information from a range of sensors at the right time so they can make the best decisions on time. In total, these modernization programs will reduce risk on the future complex battlefields by putting a squad with capability overmatch in the right place with precision, with the right information, to accomplish their mission. Additionally, we will continue to increase our rotary wing aviation. We will continue to increase our capabilities in our special operations forces. 
as well as the size of our special operations forces. We will complete the expansion sometime in the next year of our special operations forces. Together, these improvements will create dominant small unit capabilities, which combined with our soldiers' sophisticated understanding of cultures, religions, and people to create what I consider to be effective strategic land power. This will be more important as ever as we emphasize our global posture towards the Asia Pacific region in recognition of the many challenges and opportunities there. And the Army does have a critical role to play in the Asia Pacific. Seven out of the 10 largest land forces in the world are in that region. 22 out of 28, 27 of the Chiefs of Defense are Army. We will build on the strong foundation of strategic partnerships with our allies and partners while also seeking opportunities to engage in new relationships. Although America's Army is developing for the future, let me assure you that we stand ready and able to meet whatever challenges lie ahead starting today. Before I finish, I want to mention our veterans. I know that there's some here today. We are incredibly fortunate as a country to have men and women, millions of men and women, who have chosen and believe in the values and ideals that this country stands for, that are willing to fight and preserve those rights for all Americans. The Army is committed to honoring the service of every soldier, which continues for the rest of their lives, whether in uniform or not. However, it is important that we recognize that over 200,000 soldiers transition from active and reserve status to veterans every year. Many people don't realize that. We need help from all communities to give these deserving individuals the chance to bring their special qualities and skills to the civilian sector. I'll just close by assuring you that America's Army will continue its long tradition of answering the nation's call as it navigates through a period of transition. And I truly believe that America remains the land of the free because of all of those who have served and because of their bravery. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. I look forward to your questions. The strength of our nation is our army. The strength of our army is our soldiers. The strength of our soldiers is their families. And that's what makes us army strong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Well, you gave an excellent speech and you sparked more questions than I've ever seen at a World Affairs Council event. I think I have 45 and counting and we have 30 minutes. So um, I will group them a little bit and hope you can give us some insight on some of these issues. Uh, we had of course various questions on what's on everyone's mind right now and that is the US federal budget. Um, let me just ask it, group them by asking it this way. Um, the Defense Department base budget request for 2013 is $525 billion. In, uh, that, that doesn't include the operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. In 2000, the DOD budget was about $310 billion. And at the height of the Cold War, in today's dollars, it was about $400 billion a year. What do you think is appropriate sustainable, and what cuts specifically, other than the ones you mentioned in the speech, are you going to have to make to make it work? Well, I mean, a couple things. First, um, there's, a, there's always a chicken and egg argument when it comes to budget and what you can and can't do. It depends on, on, on what you ask the military to do, whether you, can, you know, whether you can afford it under the current budgets. What I would just say is over the last year, uh, we've taken a $489 billion reduction over 10 years. That's already reflected in the budgets that we'll submit over the next 10 years. Uh, with potentially $500 billion more looming if this thing called sequestration occurs. So what I would tell you is, 
And these, this is, does not at all consider at all the Afghanistan. That, that is separate. That's a separate funding. It's, it's funded completely different. So, so this is about what do you want your ability, your military to be capable of doing, your Navy, your Air Force, your Marine Corps, and your Army capable of doing around the world. And for us to continue to execute that, it would be very difficult for us to do that with an additional $500 billion cut, the way we, our strategy is currently developed. In fact, I think we've all testified in front of Congress that we would have to completely rewrite our strategy. We'd have to completely look at how we organize our military. Now, you, you gave me some numbers about how it was this way in 2001 and 2010. The, the real difference is the cost of indivi each individual soldier, marine, airman, and uh, sailor. Continues, it's doubled since 2001. That's just the reality. 51% of the Army budget is on personnel. The historical uh, percentage has always been somewhere between 41 and 45%. It has to do with the cost of medical. It has to do with the cost of, uh, of of pays that have been approved, it has to be keeping up with the cost of living. So what happens is the individual soldier, sailor, airman, marine cost of is doubled in the last 10 years. And that's the driving cost of our budgets. Uh, so for us, if we continue to get cuts, we have to reduce the size. What I worry about is in terms of, I always talk about two things. I thought about our ability to prevent conflict to shape the future environment, and then if needed, to win. Here's what I worry about. In my mind, I define prevent by the credible force, and it kind of goes back to that quote I used from Omar Bradley. You have to have a, a military that is credible and deemed to be credible outside of the U.S. And what I always talk about is to prevent the knuckleheads from miscalculating because that's what tends to drive us to conflicts. You have miscalculations by those in charge. So you want to have a capability that does not allow for miscalculation. The second piece is we have to be able to shape the environments. And I mentioned we have to continue to be able to shape in the Middle East, in the Pacific, and some other areas. And that is some expense to us to be able to shape. And by shaping, you prevent conflict. The thing I try to tell everyone is for us in uniform, for anyone here who's ever been associated with combat and war, we are the last ones who want to go back to fight wars. We see the ugly nature of what goes on. We understand the sacrifice. We understand the death and destruction, not only to human beings, but to societies that occur. So we most certainly want to prevent conflict. And we want to solve problems in many other ways. But I think there's a misconception that if you don't, if you reduce the size of the military, that that will help us prevent conflict. I will tell you that increases, in my mind, the risk of conflict because of what others might do. So that's a long answer, but it's a pretty complex question. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, the second bucket of question relates, of course, to our biggest current military commitment, that in Afghanistan. And maybe I'll just give you a couple of questions and you can answer them one by one. One is, um, how, are we, how well are we actually doing in training the Afghan military? Are they going to be able to stand on their own feet by 2014? Um, isn't the Taliban winning? Uh, are their military tactics better than the ones that we're training the Afghan military? And finally, if you could comment on the drone strategy in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, first, Sorry, uh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. I got it. The the for, first on our, our training the Afghan military. The Afghan army has made incredible progress over the last two years, two and a half years specifically. And we believe that they will be ready to take over responsibility. In fact, they have taken over responsibility in about 40 to 50 percent of Afghanistan today. And that's why we are now reducing the size of our forces. By the end of September, we'll be down to 68,000 total in Afghanistan from a high of, of over 100,000. So we are, we are slowly reducing our force as they take over more and more. 
Um, the police are a bit further behind. I found the same thing when I was in Iraq. In the Middle East, their definition of policing is much different than the Western definition of policing. And so to train a police force takes a bit longer and for them to understand what we believe policing should be. So we're, we're making some progress, but it's a bit slower. But we're somewhat confident in, in the Army. We think they'll be ready in 2014. As you know, we've committed to continue to assist them, although not necessarily in, in, in completely military ways through now 2024 through the strategic agreement. I think that means is we'll be, we'll be down to a small number of military capability post-2014, and I think it'll be mostly trainers and other things, and we'll probably still have some capability to do some counterterrorism work. Let me describe the threat of the Taliban. So I was just in Afghanistan a few months ago. I'm going back in September. But I, I get you know, fairly detailed uh, briefings from ground commanders on a routine basis. And what they'll tell you is, first off, the Taliban has been rooted out of places right now that they've been in for decades upon decades, if not centuries, where they are no longer there because they've been driven out. What I learned when I was in Iraq, and I'm seeing the same thing in Afghanistan, is when you start to see more suicide bombers and these insider threats that you see, what you're really seeing is a more desperate enemy. Because they are now resorting to terrorist tactics that they normally will not resort to. And I know sometimes that might be counterintuitive to some people. But what they can no longer do is organize a group to go against the Afghan army right now with NATO and U.S. backing, so they are turning to terrorism. And we always see that as a stage that I believe these things go through, and that's the stage that we're going through now. Drone strikes, very difficult issue. Um, As you know, and I got to be somewhat careful what I say here, there, there, are, there are drone strikes that are happening in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, some other places. Um, all, all I would say about drone strikes is as they are delivered and conducted, the amount of intelligence and the amount of uh, information that is gathered before one of those are done is quite significant. The, the the decision to do that is based on what we consider to be incredibly accurate information. And this is to go after individuals that are clearly leading the efforts in Afghanistan and some other places. What's happening now is you have the Taliban leaders are all in Pakistan. They're not in Afghanistan anymore. And so they send fighters across the border to operate in Afghanistan as they sit in Pakistan. We're working with the Pakistan military. They've done some significant operations. They're putting more and more pressure on them. And we also do that by doing some other things. So it's important in my mind that we continue to do that. The question I usually get that maybe you didn't ask me is the moral, moral, moral issue involved with drone strikes. Um, I think that's a discussion that you could have for a very, very long time. I would say uh, in some cases, if we can use drone strikes instead of putting 50,000 people on the ground, it might be worthwhile. In some cases, it might not be. And so what you have to be able to do is be, leave and have a variety of capabilities to use that we think is best in our nation's best interest and meets our, our national security needs. And I think we have to keep that door open as we continue to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we also had a few questions about Syria, which I will sum up by saying, is there a military option? And if so, how would you describe it and how feasible do you see it? There's always military options. <laughs> um, but, but I think feasibility is the, is the right term here. I, I, think, I think we have to decide what would we... What, are we capable of going in there? Are we capable of, of being effective? We certainly probably are, and we could do it if we so choose to do so. But I think in some cases, it's important that the regional players, as well as the internal players in Syria, maybe handle this. 
and I think that's what's going on now, and I think it's important that we continue to monitor and watch uh, uh, what goes on in Syria. I, I think I think we can, we can have a variety of military options from you know no-fly zones to other options that we can always execute, but I think we should do that only when it's, we believe it's absolutely in our nation's national interests. Uh, and I think, you know, I think that's, again, the decision the president would make. As a military, what we have to do is provide them a variety of options from a low-level capability all the way up to the highest capability and allow them to make the decision they think is best. You know, right now we're, we're providing humanitarian aid to refugees. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, you know, it is important for them to see that the, the American military and others, in fact, are very compassionate and humane. You know, one of the things that's always bothered me over the last 10 years is I've watched on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan the incredible amount of humanity that is provided and conducted by U.S. soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors that we tend not to get not that we want credit, but we don't, it doesn't, it's not recognized all the time. And I think that it's important that we continue to help the refugees in Syria as we watch this unfold. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to watch it, determine what's in our best national interests, and then provide a variety of options to the president for him to decide what's, what, we, what we need to do. Great, thank you. Uh, there are several questions here under the general rubric of the safety and security of our own forces. And one specifically has to do with what is the military doing to prevent rape? Another one is what is the military doing to prevent or help soldiers with post-traumatic stress syndrome and prevent suicide rates from people coming back from combat? Well, thank you. As, as you've all Somebody does a good job of reading the papers because it's a very accurate question, or all the questions are. Uh, I think you've probably all read that uh, July was the worst month we've had in the Army for suicides. Uh, now, I will say we're the only service who actually publishes our suicide rates. Um, so it is a problem that is, be, is becoming, has, has been, and continues to be of great concern. We have put a lot of dollars, effort, time, brought in lots of experts. The problem is none of these follow any pattern. And in fact, the suicides that we're having are not really all related to combat. Uh, many of them, some of the soldiers, in fact, I would say for almost half of the soldiers committing suicide never have gone to combat. So for us, it's about identifying, for me, it's about leaders down to the lowest level, knowing their soldiers, and understanding when they see a change in behavior so we can react to ensure that the event of suicide does not occur, that we can react, we can intercede, and prevent something very tragic such as suicide is happening. I also believe that as a society, suicides are going up. By the way, nobody else, the, we, we don't have current statistics on suicides within the country. So I believe it's, a, it's a something we have to address throughout the country, is suicides. We have a huge problem in the Army, and we're putting a lot of resources into it. One of the things that we talk a lot about is resiliency. It's about building resiliency. We have training programs that we put our leaders through that help to build resiliency in our own soldiers, and it goes from uh, self-confidence. It goes, how do you react to negative things that occur to you and builds, builds strength and mechanisms in individuals that allow them to respond correctly when things go wrong. And so we are working hard to build this resiliency capacity within the force. We need it for several reasons. We need it for just basically what we do, but we also need it when it comes to preventing suicides. Let me, let me just go to rape. Let me sexual assault, sexual harassment. It is appalling to me that we continue to have problems with sexual harassment and sexual assault in the military. And frankly, it's against what I just talked about. I talked a little bit about the uh, importance of some of the basic fundamentals that we believe we should have in the military. First, one, the trust. When you put a uniform on, 
you should have inherent trust in everyone else who wears this uniform. Because we have to trust each other in the most difficult situations. You have to rely completely on somebody else to ensure that maybe sometimes they save your life. And to me, it's appalling that we have soldiers committing crimes against other soldiers. Our females have been in combat now for over 20 years as part of the Army, starting in Desert Storm back in Panama in 1990, and then, then through the Iraq War and Afghan War, and they performed superbly. And it's important that they can trust those who are in the uniform next to them. And they, we should be protective of them. They shouldn't be worried about a threat from another soldier. So we are taking this very seriously, but it's hard. It's first people having trust to report. Secondly, it's, having, it's, it's, secondly, it's our ability to collect the right evidence. We now have, have created special units to collect evidence. Uh, when we have sexual assaults. We hadn't, didn't have that before. They're now specially trained. We have labs set up, especially around the country, in order for us to do a better job. So when we have to prosecute, we have the evidence necessary. All of this takes time. We certainly aren't anywhere near where we need, need to be, but we're working through it. And then finally, PTSD. PTSD is an incredibly difficult problem. And there's a, the problem is, is a, if, you go to, if you went to 10 doctors, they will give you 11 opinions on PTSD. Because it's difficult. It's difficult to determine what the causes are. It's difficult to determine how someone will act. And it's difficult. People can't even agree on how they should be treated. So we have to continually come up with new ways on how we deal with PTSD. Because this is not going away. This is going to be with us for at least another 10, maybe 20 years. As we continue to have soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines impacted by their experiences. PTS is curable. And it's important for us to give them the tools necessary for this, so they can continue to contribute in a positive way. And so we continue to invest heavily in this. You know, we have a couple things. One is the stigma of first admitting you have a problem. And yes, in the military, we focus on mental and physical toughness. And so, but what we don't want is people to translate that into, I have to be careful about saying I have a problem because nobody will ever think I'm no, I'm, I'm no longer mentally or physically tough. That's an issue. So the first thing we have to do is ensure that people are aware that we think it's important that they come forward when they need help. And we're actually going to be joining here with the NFL. They have the same issue with a couple other things. And we're actually to bring awareness to this issue of not being, being willing to come forward if you have an issue. Uh, and we're going to do that here in the next week or so. Thank you. Excellent answer. Uh, I, I'm actually surprised. I had several questions here about reinstituting the draft. And we've been a professional military now for decades. And largely you see, I'm summarizing the question, largely you see folks of lower socioeconomic backgrounds going into the military and doing the fighting for us. Would it be fairer as a society, and do you think it would be more effective for the military to instead reinstitute a draft? Yeah, I think this is something that's controversial. I, I'm not sure I quite agree with the statement that everyone in the military is from the lower social economic I, I just don't think it's true. I think the Army and the Marine Corps and others reflect society, frankly. We do today. You'd be amazed at some of the people that volunteer to come into the Army. Uh, we have graduates from the Ivy Leagues and graduates from many other institutions who volunteer to come in as privates to serve in their country. We, we see it all the time. So when we had the draft, I want to go back and go through history. My numbers won't be exactly right, okay? But our army was much, much bigger. In Vietnam, it was over a million people. For Desert Storm, we had 800,000 in the army, in the active army. Today, after we get done downsizing, we'll have 490,000, the smallest since the end of World War II. So 
The draft has a lot to do with size. If, you, if you're a bigger force, I would argue, yes, maybe a draft is better. You get more people in the Army. But if you only have 400,000 people and it's only going to be 1% serving, the number's not going to change. Uh, maybe, you get a, maybe you might think you get more diversity throughout, but you also get a lot of people who do not want to serve. And when you have a smaller force, it becomes more difficult. If you have a larger force, I believe you can deal with more that maybe don't want to serve. So what I, what I, have to, what I think we have to do is maximize the small number that I think we're going to have. We've got to get people who want to do it, that are, that, are, that are raising their right hand to say, this is what I want to do, it's something I, I believe in, and it enables us to be more efficient and effective as a military. Now, what we have to do better, then, is reaching out to our local populations. What I worry about is not that only 1% or less than 1% are serving. That's always going to be the case. What I worry about is we're not reaching out enough to communities so they understand who their military are. We got to do a better job at that. So you understand who we are. Who are the people that wear this uniform? Why do we do it? What are the things we're doing? I think that's the most important thing. And that's hard to do, but we have to do better. So that's kind of my answer to that. It is, it is you could, I could, if you ask me, I could make an argument of why we should have a draft. I, I can make that argument. But for me, the best for us is to continue along the all volunteer force. It is more expensive. But in my mind, it's worth it because of the quality, capability, and the efficiency and effectiveness that we get out of the all-volunteer force. Thank you. How do you see the future of the reserve components of the military? How do they fit into the strategy over the next five, ten well, years? Well, they're essential because as we, as we draw down the active component, we mitigate some of that risk by having a reserve that, if necessary, can be called upon. Uh, you know, the difference between the active and reserve component is time. Is there time to train, their time to be ready, because obviously it's a very part-time job for them. But it does enable us to uh, get them involved in, in training capabilities, and because we've had to use them over the last 10 years, the capability of our reserve component is higher than it's been in a very long time. So it's we have to have a balance between active and reserve component in, in, the, in the Army. And we got to strike that right balance of what's needed to be available today, tomorrow, and then the reserve component that we can use to increase our capacity when necessary or help to respond to state disasters because they also have that responsibility within the own state. So we have to balance that. And so the reserve component is not going anywhere. They play an important role. But if we get further cuts, we're going to have to continue to figure out how much of the active and reserve component we keep and how much goes away. And it'll be both that lose and strength if we get additional cuts based on sequestration. Great. Thank you. Uh, a few questions along the lines of what you and I discussed right before we started, and that's um, cyber warfare. What are you doing to prepare for it? And importantly, for a Silicon Valley audience, what is the Army doing to more effectively incorporate fast-moving and ever-changing technologies? Uh, first, let me, uh, cyber. It is, in my mind, a large threat, not only to our military, but to our country. It is a very cheap way for our adversaries to invest and attempt to attack our country, whether it be our financial systems, whether it be our electrical systems, whether it be uh, privacy and gaining information, it's a real threat. And we all have to understand that. So the difficulty is how we protect ourselves, uh, but still maintain our freedoms that we so value, and that's very difficult. The Army, the military has established a new command called Cyber Command. It's been stood up now for uh, several years that is totally dedicated uh, to this subject. Uh, the Army is investing more money over this next cycle of budgets uh, in order to increase our capabilities, both in people and, cap and, and equipment capabilities, to protect ourselves, protect our networks, military networks, uh, and also in the future have the capability to potentially do offensive cyber operations if we so choose to use them. 
And so we will continue to work that very heavily over the next several years. And you asked me, oh, and then uh, new technologies. The Army, about two years ago, started a thing called the network integration exercise. We did this because we could not keep up fast enough with the developments that are occurring in the civilian community in terms of networks, uh, whether it be, you know, like iPhone technology, the speed and capability. And to us, as I mentioned earlier, information is key to us, and our ability to move information is becoming more and more critical. So we have this network integration exercise that is run every six months, and it's soldiers in the field. We put out uh, the soldiers in the field that actually run the exercise and are given new technologies. So what we do now is we publish uh, requirements that we have for our networks, and any company can say, I have something that we think fits that, and they come participate in this exercise. If we find it to be interoperable and capable, then we'll, we will then move into an acquisition process to integrate this. This enables us to utilize the most recent technology that's being developed on the information side, and for us, it's incredibly important because technology changes almost every year. So what we have to do is do it on cycles. We'll probably go on two-year cycles to increase our capability to move information. And that's the thought process behind this. Thank you. This will be the last question because I want to be respectful of your time. You spent a lot of time personally in Iraq and were really one of the primary implementers of the surge strategy. Iraq has been off the front pages for a while now, but I do have several questions about how are we doing there? Are we succeeding? Uh, what do you think the future looks like there? Well, as I've said uh, many times, and I'll, I'll say it again, I'm, I'm still pretty consistent. You know, a lot of people first, you know, so you, what you didn't ask me, but I, I'm going to answer the question anyhow, is was it worthwhile that we went indirect? That's usually the question I get, and you probably got it, but being nice not asking me that question. <laughs> Didn't get it. You didn't. You didn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, well you can answer it. I won't comment on whether it's worthwhile or not. I think that's your own. But I will say one thing. I, I do believe the fact that Saddam Hussein is no longer in control has made a significant difference. We can't ever forget that. I think that um, we don't know what kind of actor he would be today if he was still in charge of Iraq and what impact he would have on, on the war on terror, on stability in the Middle East. And I think it would have been significant. So I think the fact that this brutal dictator, who we learn later on in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that he killed was quite significant getting rid of him. And I think in part of the problem we had in Iraq was we didn't realize the societal devastation that had occurred over the previous 20 years. What people forget is Iraq had been at war since 1980. They went to war with Iran for eight years. They then went into Kuwait and tried to take over Kuwait. We then had the no-fly zone, we had sanctions, and then we had the, when we went in and toppled Saddam Hussein. So it's been 30 years that that country has basically been at war or been under international sanctions. And frankly, the country was breaking internally. And so what we saw was this underlying hidden fracturing of the society that, over, that bubbled over once Saddam Hussein was taken out of power. I think we misunderstood it. I think we didn't realize what was going to happen. But I think it's important it did. And I think now Iraq can start to move forward. It's not clean. The Iraqi security forces that we left behind are sustaining a level of security. Is there some terrorism in Iraq? Yes. Will there still be some violence? Yes. But Iraq is moving forward. For the first time now, they are now uh, exporting more oil than they did uh, ever in their history. They're about, they're, they're, they're somewhere around 3 million barrels a day. We believe in two or three years, they'll be up to 5 million barrels a day. So I think it'll have an impact on both the international community and also their country. To me, how Iraq turns out is dependent on two things. One is, what do they do with the wealth that they get when they start selling 5 million barrels a day? Will it be distributed among the population evenly or will there be just a few who gain the wealth? And that will determine, in my opinion, how well Iraq goes forward. Secondly, is politically. Is they've had three elections. Every one of the three democratic elections they've had were overseen by the United Nations and the American military. 
and I thought they went very well. Iraqis want to be select their leaders. They want to be, have a democratic system. Does that system continue? So those are the two questions. If in two years from now, when they have their next election for a prime minister, if it goes forward, they have a good, honest election, and the, the oil continues to be developed, and they're reinvesting that into their people, I think Iraq will continue to move forward. And I think as we see everything out play out in the Middle East right now, you're seeing Iraq is fairly neutral. That would not have been the case 10 years ago. So I, I think they're kind of heading in the right direction, but I am not going to sit here and predict that Iraq will turn out exactly right. I think they certainly have the capability to. I think we have to stay engaged politically and economically with Iraq. And I think if we do that, we increase the chances significantly. Great. Thank you very much for those excellent and very forthcoming answers. We appreciate it. Thank you.